Lord, we thank you for your kindness, for your love for your people, that you pursue us, that you value us, that you help us uh, in the places where we are weak and struggling. And so, Lord, you know where each of us is, what our Mondays have been like, what our breaks have been like. Um, We're in lots of different places. So, Father, we ask for your mercy that you would meet us where we are and help us to um, see the challenges in our lives um, in light of who you are. Help us to trust you with them. And Lord, we pray that as we read your word tonight, that it would not return to you empty, that we would be transformed. So open our eyes, open our ears, and help us to learn and grow and learn to love your son, the Lord Jesus, more. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to start with a true story that happened last week. So the names have been protected. The names have been changed to protect the innocent in this. So does, why? Okay, this is someone I care about, Grace. She lent her jacket out last week. So Grace and her friend Jamie were at practice. It was 34 degrees out, and they were going to be outside for at least an hour. And Jamie says, oh no, I forgot my windbreaker. He's in a t-shirt and shorts. I don't have a sweatshirt. Can I use yours? And Grace said, yeah, sure, you can wear it. So she went to her car, got her windbreaker out of the car, handed it to him. And so after practice, it was, you know, practice was fine. Nothing, you know, nothing notable or tellable happened during practice, evidently, because I didn't ever hear about the practice. Um, So Grace and Jamie and all their other teammates, or the ones that could stay, went inside the basketball gym. Um, where there were going to be two games. There's the girls' game was first, and then the boys' game. And um, Grace and Jamie ended up sitting on opposite sides of the bleachers. Jamie wanted to sit by the players. Grace wanted to sit with her friends and with the civilians, as she called them. So Grace stayed for the girls' game, and then she left. She had things to do at home, homework, and um, Jamie stayed later. So she was sitting on the sofa, and... I I heard it happen. I watched it happen. He texted her about 9 p.m. Did you get your windbreaker? And Grace said, what? No. Do you still have it? And Jamie texted, no. I left it in the bleachers where I was sitting. Grace said, no. I didn't get it because I left after the girls game. And Jamie said, Oh, <laughs> so uh, Grace was pretty upset. I got to, I, this didn't come through the text. Um, the text conversation, I think, stopped at that point. Um, it's like, you know, who borrows a windbreaker? It's a uniform for track. You need to have it. It was $20. I paid $20 for that, but you borrow it and then you just leave it. I know people at school, it's already stolen. People have already stolen it. It's not there anymore. I've totally lost it. Um, That, so in that drama, and there's an unspoken expectation that someone would respect what was entrusted to them. It belongs to something, somebody else. And that really, Grace didn't say like, you know, please take care of it and don't let it out of your sight until you give it back to me. But that was just unspoken and understood that I'm going to entrust it to you and you're going to take care of it until you return it back to me. Um, And uh, the burden of caring for it is on the borrower. And so Grace thought about that windbreaker all night. We talked about it. Um, There may have been some tears. Uh, It was the first thing on her mind when she woke up. Uh, she drove to school early. She was there waiting. Mrs. Gallagher wasn't there where she normally is to let them in. Um, as soon as she could, as soon as humanly possible, she went in and immediately went to the gym, couldn't see it, but went and searched it out. And there it was tucked under a seat kind of, I don't know why or how it got tucked in that place, but, um, there it was. And immediately I got a text got my jacket. 
So happy story. You don't have to be like, oh no, what happened to Grace's? But here's the point. Grace's windbreaker was $20 originally. It was now three years used. It's a, you know, it's a school uniform sort of thing. So, you know, I mean, it was not as nice as it was when it, um, when, you know, uh, when she first got it, it would have, it is replaceable, right? But it was right for her to be upset. How much more concerned can someone be, an owner be, when what has been borrowed is more valuable? And maybe you've done that. Maybe you've loaned somebody a car. You've let someone stay in your apartment. You've um, given, entrusted to them a favorite book. Um, How much more responsibility when what is entrusted is beloved? A family heirloom, a loved one, a child. A grandparent. Um, tonight we're studying two books, Joel and Obadiah, and we're thinking about some hard stuff. I pretty much guarantee that there's going to be hard stuff tonight that you were maybe not wanting to hear today. And probably that's for me too. Um, but here's kind of the big picture. I think it's not going to make sense unless we look at it in a way like this. Um, God made this world and everything in it. It is his. This is his world. And he made it for his purposes, to reflect his glory, to receive his blessing. He created us humans in his own image to be vice regents, his caretakers of this world, that we would be image bearers as we're going out and through all this world and we would be ruling, not ruling absolutely, but ruling under his good authority and in ways that reflect his character, showing kindness and compassion and mercy and loving, um, establishing order, caring for the weak and the downtrodden. Uh, He entrusted his world to us. We didn't ask for it. Uh, We didn't ask to belong to him. Uh, We didn't ask to be made in his image, but that's the way it is. And he and, you know, and this is the framework that we have to hold on to if this is going to make sense to us. Um, he reserves the right to set the rules with his creation, including us. And so friends, it doesn't take um, within that, that's the narrative framework. Um, you can look at the news and it doesn't, you know, maybe two seconds and figure out like, or be reminded that we have not done humans. We have not taken good care of what has been entrusted to us. We're not, I mean, this pushes on us in some hard ways, and that's one of them. You and I are not great at taking care of what's entrusted to us. I mean, I can certainly say that about me. Um, We also pushes on us because we don't like the idea that we're accountable to somebody else, that we belong to someone else. And that we don't have a say about what we, or what we should be doing. And that someone has the right to follow up with us. Um, and then it also pushes on us. So like in ways we're like Jamie, poor Jamie. I'm <laughs> sure he, he's, not, he's not a horrible person. But in ways we're like Jamie. But in ways we're also like the jacket. Right? Um, because we can think and fear that no one is coming back for us. We don't know that the Lord, we are on his mind constantly. There is nothing else that he thinks about but our world, his creation, his son, his glory, you and me made in his image, his church. That is on his mind. And I'm thinking, speaking, you know, anthropological, or I mean, like, this is just, I'm using the metaphor, like, when he gets up and when he goes to bed, obviously the Lord doesn't sleep, so that's a metaphor, but, like, it is, we are on his mind all the time, but you and I can fear. We can look around in our personal lives and our, and our world and think, this is just the way it's going to be. I guess I have to deal with my heart being like this, this relationship being like that, our country being like that. We can be afraid. 
right? Um, so this is, uh, this, is a, <laughs> this is a hard passage for us. Um, so here's the, as we push into that story, when humans, we rebelled against God's good authority, the very first humans, Adam and Eve, um, sin and death entered our lives and corrupted the world, the whole world, God's world. God could have thrown it away. It's his, right? But he didn't. This world, we matter to him. He values us. He loves us. And so how much more than Grace, who was just like, you know, pro- propelled to like go and like retrieve her jacket. Like he is purpose to reclaiming his world, all of it. And he is so committed. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to pay the price for it to be restored from every trace of bad and evil and brokenness and sadness. He's 100% committed that plan and he will not be dissuaded. He will punish sin. He will cleanse it from the world. He will save a people for himself. He will redeem the whole world to reflect his glory and receive his blessing. And that, dear friends, is there's good stuff in there, but there's also a lot of hard. Um, And we don't necessarily like to hear it. um, But so this is not a drive-by week that you... (laughs) You and I, and I'm sorry, first time people, we're, we're glad, we're really glad to have you here. We don't always talk about um, God's severe judgment. Not that we can't and shouldn't keep that in mind, but this is a truth that needs to shatter us in the right places and move us to the right response. Um, you and I must face it. We cannot remain neutral about a topic like this. This is not like going through a drive drive by or we can, you know, drive through, or we can just go and like pick up a little God's word, like have a nice meal and then drive on like, you know, nothing really significant has happened. Um, this is weighty stuff. So we, God is certainly coming to reclaim his world. And so I think that's our main truth that we can learn, but you and I must respond and we must respond together and we should respond. I suggest to you the right way in these three things. There's threefold response. We must face the truth, we must repent from sin, and we must wait well for God's deliverance. And so that's going to be our outline tonight. Um, and it's in these two tiny little prophetic books um, tucked in the Old Testament. They're beautiful, um, prophetic poetry. They're filled with startling images to get our attention, to face the truth. Um, but it's not linear. So even though I have this linear outline, and like some neat linear divisions. Um, this is just a basic framework. Um, there, it's, it's all more complicated to that. And I want to remind us too that uh, these books are writ- not written to us. They're written for us. And so we are overhearing conversations that historical prophets from the Lord had to certain real live historical flesh and blood people we're meant to overhear it. Um, when the prophets say you, it's n- not actually talking about you and me, but we're meant to overhear it and learn about the Lord. So um, with that, without further ado, that was a long intro and I'm sorry, but let's uh, open up our Bibles. We're going to be in, um, we're going to be in Joel mostly, but with Obadiah secondarily. So um, here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm sorry about the flipping back and forth. Um, so I really do recommend if you are, have your Bible on um, you know, your device, use also a pew Bible because that's just going to be like have both. So be in Joel in your main Bible and then open up to Obadiah in your, um, in your secondary Bible. Um, we studied Amos the last week we were together and Joel and Obadiah make an Amos sandwich. So Joel, so if you can find Amos, you've found... Joel and Obadiah, or just look in your table of contents. Okay, so um, here's, we're going to look at our first division. Um, We must face, God is coming to reclaim his world. That is certain. We must face that truth. Um, And so we're going to be looking at Joel 1, 1 to 2, 11. And so, um, and Obadiah verses 1 to 9, just 
briefly. And so Joel's message to the people of Judah. So Joel, we don't know when Joel was written. Actually, we don't really know when Obadiah was written. If you look at both of those, there's no historical marker at the top of them. Scholars think maybe any time between the ninth and the fourth century BC. So pretty much a 500 year period. Of, um, we're not really certain there's, so you're, we're reading the uh, material inside to sort of infer what was going on. The problem is with, with prophecy, sometimes prof- prophets spoke about future things as if they were past because they were so certain to have happened, to, to happen, that they spoke about them in past tense. Your vantage moves all around. And it's looking at, prof, reading prophecy can be like a mount, looking at a mountain range where you can't, there's not a good depth perception between near and far. So the mountain peaks look like they're close together. And so a near prophecy, something that's going to happen imminently in the time of um, Joel, Joel or right after that in the people of Judah, uh, their lives can be right next, can seem like, you know, in the text, right next to something that's not going to really be fulfilled until the very end, final days of uh, human history as we would know it. So, um, okay, a main theme of Joel is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming. And so it's predominantly a fire alarm for the people of Judah. Wake up. Um, The day of the Lord is a phrase in the Bible that describes a unique day set apart from all other days. What day is that? It's that day. So sometimes the Bible will talk about it on that day, um, the last day. And so broadly speaking, the day of the Lord refers to the time. It's not necessarily one 24-hour period, but the time when God is going to come to reclaim his world in a full way. So with Jesus, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is is here. And it's now, it for sure is now, but also we are awaiting the not yet when Jesus, our Lord and King will come back and his, and his kingdom will be consummated fully. And so on that day, the day of the Lord, God all is going to do simultaneously two things. There will be great judgment, great judgment of sin rebellion that is treason against God, the king. Simultaneously with that judgment is great deliverance. There is great deliverance. You can't separate judgment and deliverance in the Bible. They're, they're, they're almost like, like they're interwoven because if you're judging evildoers, you're delivering people who the evildoers are, are afflicting. Does that make sense? So there's great judgment um, great, great deliverance, and both are extremes. So, um, yeah, let's let's jump in. So, Joel is in this first section, startling, using startling imagery to describe um, this devastating time that's going to be coming. And in chapter one, he seems to describe a, a locust plague a locust swarm that came and ate everything in their path. And then in chapter two, it seems to morph into a bigger invasion, a perhaps military invasion um, that sounds like an army. And there's similar imagery used in the book of Revelation for locusts and armies. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to read a big chunk of this first section in Joel and just let the images wash over you. And listen to, listen for the call to face the truth. Um, hear that, okay, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, um, verse two. Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So whatever's gonna happen, it's gonna be big. It's gonna be tellable and memorable. Verse four, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has has eaten. There have been three waves of locusts that came and eat everything. Locust swarm is a real thing that happens 
say like if you can Google it, um, you can see like in in Africa, for instance, that it happens sometimes, and they're just everywhere. Um, what I read, I've never been in a locust swarm. I don't out like locusts whatsoever. Um, but what I read was that in one square kilometer, there could be up to 80 million locusts, and they would eat 80 million tons of green stuff in a day. I mean, just devastating. And if you can imagine three of those going through, there's nothing green. For people who don't have refrigerators and don't have freezers, that's really, really hard to hear. Um, So this is, and notice how it's spoken of in the past tense. See that prophetic, a prophetic past right there. Um, Verse five, awake you drunkards and weep and wail you drinkers of wine because the sweet wine for it is cut off from your mouth for a nation has come up against my land. So there's the uh, imagery. So we have locust imagery juxtaposed of military imagery. Um, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. The Lord would speak of his country, Israel. The whole world belongs to him, but he speaks of Israel particularly as my vine, my fig tree. And here there's a nation that's come up against them. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. Everything is gone. They can't even worship the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed, verse 10. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up, the oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished, the vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the Son of Man. And call, it goes on calling for a fast, um, beautiful poetry. I mean, devastating and startling, but um, really made to get attention, right? Um, okay. Uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. And you guys can talk more about that. Um, Actually, flip over into Obadiah, and we'll just look briefly to see that same pattern. So Obadiah, we see this sort of announcing the judgment that's going to come. Obadiah um, speaks about a different sort of kind of judgment, the vision of Obadiah. Thus, so verse one, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. So Edom was uh, a country to the south and, and east of Judah and Samaria, aka um, the northern kingdom or Israel. Um, Edom was related to the Israelites sort of distantly. So Esau and Jacob, Jacob is the forefather of the Israelites whose name was changed to Israel. They were twin brothers and Esau was born first. So they're about the same age and they spent their whole lives wrestling with each other. You can talk about that in your groups. So notice that here, this is a judgment concerning that country. Again, the whole world belongs to the Lord. He's not okay with sin and brokenness in his people. And he's not okay with it anywhere else against people who uh, are you know, not the ones in Israel who were specifically set apart to be his agents of blessing of, of um, his reclamation project. Um, so uh, we, so going on, sorry, that's uh, still in the middle of verse one. We have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise up against her for battle. So again, the Lord uses, he has used human armies to judge his uh, people or to judge other nations. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You live in the clefts of the rock, it seems like as they go on, um, in your lofty dwelling. Who says in your heart, who will bring me down from the ground down to the ground? So Edom evidently feels really secure. Um, they shouldn't. And going on in verse five, like with thieves and with grape gatherers, like it would be better for them if a thief came in 
and like took everything because the thief would le- actually leave something. So the imagery is there's going to be nothing left. Um, and how Esau has been pillaged, his treasures shot, sought. Um, and verse eight, will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau. And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Taman. Um, that's a city in the south of Edom, so that the, every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So really hard stuff, right? And know that, like, um, this is Obadiah was written, like it says, concerning Edom, but it's also written in Hebrew. And it's preserved in the Hebrew scriptures. So think about that, like, God's people probably from the very beginning were meant to overhear this conversation and learn about the Lord um, and learn about and respond rightly. Um, okay, so uh, oh, just a principle for the section, uh, first section about facing the truth. A uh, principle I think we can learn is that there will be nothing small about the day of the Lord. There will be nothing small about the day of the Lord. Um, I thought about like when there's a movie, what comes next? Like the action figures, right? So um, with Frozen, Star Wars, Toy Story, the Pirates of the Caribbean. See, I'm kind of old and dated. Those are as far, like, but you could fill in the blank. Like the movie comes first, then the merchandise, right? The little, so you have the real hero and then you have the little baby heroes that get to play around, right? Um, God's economy is the opposite. The minifigures, the merchandise comes out first. It comes out before the real deal, right? Hannah's, Hannah's frowning at me. I'll explain. Okay, if the precursors, so there's these uh, prophetic um, figures and th- events and happenings that happen early, those aren't the big deal. And then, oh, at the very end, the culmination, the final day of judgment that the Lord has. Wow, but man, the great flood, that was really big. That, you know, the final day, that was, you know, that was okay. You know, so it's like, it's reversed. Does that make sense? Okay, so the, think about the times that God has judged in the Bible, like the great flood in Genesis 6. Um, the Assyrian conquest of the northern Israel, which we haven't gotten to yet, but in 2 Kings 17, we're getting to very close because God's people keep not listening to the warnings that God is sending. God doesn't want to judge. He does not delight in judgment. He wants people to turn and repent, but his holy character demands. He is going to take back what belongs to him and there will be no unholiness. And so um, the Exodus, the Babylonian conquest, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, if these are the many figures, these are the small days of the Lord, how much greater will be the final day? The final judgment, there will be nothing small about the day of the Lord. God's word warns us that his judgment is certain and it's not small. And I wonder, would you say that you live like these little judgments were the the real deal, that they were the bigger ones? Or this one, the final one, is the bigger one? That's not the warm and fuzzy news that you and I probably want to hear. But think about this. God didn't have to wait. He didn't have to warn um, God is doing a loving thing. He is patient. He is not wanting to perish. And he speaks his truth clearly in his word, and so must we. It is not loving to ignore the truth about God's certain judgment. It, is, it will be, uh, let's see, actually, let's just read that last section. Um, uh, and jo- sorry, flip back to Joel. Joel um, coming to... Joel 2, 10, and 11, the earth quakes before them. That's the, um, the horde that is coming in. The heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his world is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. 
Who can endure it? Um, That day uh, should drastically change the fact that it's coming, the way that we think and live. God calls us to awaken. We must awaken to the spiritual peril of ourselves and or those around us. Um, he, we must not be numb to the horrifying judgment. Um, and I wonder, uh, what does that truth do to you and to me? Uh, we, you and I, we need to face it. Even if we squirm under the reality, it needs to shatter us in the right places and move us to the right response. And for those of us who trust in Christ, it can be really easy for us to just think about a truth like that and say, well, got that covered. Uh, Jesus bore the wrath I deserved when he died on the cross. He rose again to prove it. Hallelujah. And that is true, my friends. That is truth. He is our true refuge and only refuge on that day. And yet we must not be numb to the horrifying reality of God's judgment waiting to come on this world. We are called to have compassion for those who, as of yet, will have nowhere to hide on that day. Who in your life has nowhere to hide on that day. That day is coming, and that day is certain. Um, God uses, uh, God wants us to know his judgment is coming. He used anything and everything to call to us. Hard circumstances get our attention, and that's what God is after, our attention. And that doesn't mean that every sickness, economic crisis, earthquake, or car accident is God's displeasure, um, but it's always right to ask, God, in this hard thing, what are you wanting me to learn? God, in this hard thing, lost my job. My friend said that. What do you want me to learn? Um, In this case, Joel is calling for national and individual repentance. Um, and his message isn't going to be what you like. You watch a, like a movie. I, I watched a movie recently. It was like there, there was a huge crisis and tons of people were in danger, and they were the good people, you know, that you're rooting for. And yet you hear like the mom says to her child, like, "Shh, it, it's going to be okay." Friends, that is not the message. It is not going to be okay. Joel says, "Wake up, mourn, wail, despair." Um, the calls that we hear come to a head in the next section. God will judge his world. That is certain. We must respond. So let's turn to our next, leads us to our next um, division. We must repent and turn from sin. Um, And we'll be looking at just these two little sections, verses chapter two of uh, Joel 12 through 17 and Obadiah verses 10 through 14. Um, and so let's just read uh, Joel 12, 2, 12, and 13. Um, so even now, just like, and keep that startling imagery in your mind, the locust coming through and the army coming through, the day of the Lord is terrible and it's coming. Um, verse 12, the Lord says, even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Um, And so they called for for people to fast and and mourn and be consecrated in verse 17 between the vestibule and the altar. So that uh, is temple language. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword against your, the, among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Um, and so notice in verse 12, what are the two uh, main imperatives there? Um, is return and rend. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. So let's look just quickly at those two. Um, First, return. When the Lord calls for returning, um, that is a call for repentance. Um, That's what repentance is. It's turning. So when, you know, when people say repent, like here, you know, that is sort of a churchy Christianity sort of word, like repent. I don't know that people actually use that in the real world about any other thing. I mean, we've kind of taken it over, right? Christianity would be like, this is our word. 
it's just for us. Well, it shouldn't just be for us, but, um, return, but it definitely should be for us, right? Um, if God's going to hold the nations accountable, how much more is he going to hold his people accountable? God's going to clean his house first. Um, what was I saying? Okay. Return. Like returning is, is it's actually what it is. It's like, stop going the way that you're going and turn around and go the other way. And usually it's probably 180, right? But turn, uh, run back to the Lord. Um, and that might feel counterintuitive. If we look at the, like in chapter two, verse 11, uh, look at the Lord, man, utters his voice before his army, his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. Um, return to him. Like that feels really scary. And yet um, he's thundering at the head of his army. We can do that. We should do that. We should encourage other people to do that because that's not all who he is. God doesn't want to judge. He wants to have a posture of blessing, of compassion. He's slow to anger and forgiveness um, and abound it in, in steadfast love. Look at, we can do that because we know God's character is sure. And he, we can, we can know the answer. He's gracious and merciful. That's quoting the Lord, um, what he spoke his own name to Moses in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Um, and he relents over disaster. And so the question in 14, who knows whether he will not turn and relent? Hey, we know, right? There's a whole testimony of God's word that says we know what God does when people turn and not just turn in the outward way, Uh, but they turn wholeheartedly. When God's people turn to him in repentance, he forgives and restores them. We're gonna see that in that third section um, coming up in Joel. But the second thing is rend. Like, um, and this is a hard part about repent. This is a hard part about repentance. Uh, Rending means tearing. And so the imagery there to rend your heart and not your garments. In the ancient Near East, a sign of grief and lament was to tear your clothes. And so if you're familiar with the Bible, you have probably read about people who have teared their, torn their clothes when they are grieving. Now think about that. That's a big deal. If you're in the ancient Near East, you probably maybe have one change of clothes, maybe two, three if you were incredibly wealthy. And for you to tear your clothes, that's a huge deal. Can you imagine like proportionally tearing up all the clothes in your, in your closet, all the clothes in your drawers are all torn up and that's, but it should be, that's an outward expression of an inward reality. Friends, sin has fractured us anyway. We are torn apart and maybe you feel that tension in, in, I do in my heart, right? There's a part of my heart that wants to love and follow the Lord. There's another part of my heart that says, no, this is my life. I want to do what I want to do. I want to watch that show. I want to spend my time doing this way. And like, there's that, that tearing. Um, and so the Lord is saying, he doesn't want just outward behavior modification. Oh, just come to church and be nice to that person and don't murder and don't lie. Yes, yes, yes. We should definitely do those things. He doesn't want us on the outside. He wants everything because again, it only makes sense if we think about the fact that grace jacket was all hers didn't belong to Jamie, didn't belong to school. It was all hers, belonged to her. And like all of you, all of me belongs to the Lord. And he's not going to be satisfied with 90% or 98% or 99.9 repeating percent. Like he wants all of you and all of me. And he, by the grace of Jesus Christ, he, he does that work, right? That's what the work of the Spirit does. That we're t- and we'll come to that in the... Um, do we come to that in this section? Or is it the next session? Um, I think it, it was... I, put, I had to put it in the next division with the Holy Spirit. Um, anyway, okay. All right. So, um, outward sign of an inward reality. Um, mourning isn't something that we like to do in our culture. We push against it. We think happy is good, sad is bad. We love to laugh, but Joel says we need to cry. We need to mourn the state of this world and the state of our hearts. The reality is our world has been ravished by sin and yet it doesn't shock us. Um, Other sin should make us sad. If you flip to um, Obadiah verses 10 to 14, um, we hear more about uh, the 
Edomite sin specifically, remember again, Israelites were meant to overhear this, I suggest to you. And so what should God's people, when they read this, should we be like, yeah, Edom has been so horrible to us. Yeah, they're going to get it. No, other sin should cause us lament. Even when their sin has been against us, we should grieve uh, and mourn that and, uh, the, and make us sad. And our own sin should make us sad. Um, maybe we aren't very sad because we don't think we're that bad. Um, we must awaken to our need for ongoing repentance. There isn't a purposeful, effective sorrow over sin that the Holy Spirit prompts in our lives. And to mourn with our, mourn our own sin is to agree with God about it, to not make any excuses or to blame others for it, and to recognize that our sin costs us and it harms others. It costs others. And more importantly, our sin costs Jesus. Because on the cross, we see the extravagant love an extreme cost it took to pay for your sin and for mine. And Jesus cross, uh, Jesus on the cross was directly tied not to just a nebulous sense of humanity's sin, which of course um, it, his blood and sacrifice does cover, but also and especially to my sin, my specific sin, um, and your specific sin. And we must own the fact that it was my anger, my lustful thought yesterday, my lie to make myself look better, my wanting someone else's car, my gossip about my boss, my lack of care with what belongs to God that hung Jesus on the cross and he bore it. Does that not make you glad and sad? Should, um, is there a sin you minimize and excuse? And how might you fail to assess the cost of sin to your life, to others, to Jesus? Um, but mourning for sin, God promises, is temporary um, because we can look ahead to uh, this third division, principle for the second division. Sorry, I'm running out of time and I'm just going to go super fast. Um, repentance is the only reasonable response to God's judgment. Repentance is the only reasonable response to God's judgment. Um, but going on to the, the, the next section, um, we must wait well for his return and specifically for those of us who are trusting in Christ for his deliverance. Um, and so in this last session, there's juxtaposed these images and they're very extreme of great blessing, just abundant joy and gladness and obedience to the Lord, perfect obedience to the Lord and also juxtaposed great judgment. And so know that, friends. There is no middle, middle or future within the, the narrative of the scriptures, which I hold to be trustworthy and I encourage you to do that too. There is no ending, sorry, middle ground. There is, that's just sort of middle of the road. How was your Monday? Oh, it was all right. It was fine. Um, do you have a, yeah, it was Okay. There won't be any, and the, and the end of all days and into eternity, that will not be the case. There will be abundant blessing. Knock your socks off. You can't imagine it. Joy and blessing and gladness for those who turn to the Lord and accept his forgiveness and his rec recreation of us in Christ, that we are the ones, that we belong to him and we say, yes, we're the sheep of, of your flock. Yes, we're exactly who you want us to be. And then, and, and you're giving us the power to obey in that, or so abundant blessing or abundant wrath that is utterly terrifying and no escape. That is the picture that the scriptures provide for us, Joel and Obadiah, and also uh, the whole, and, you know, going into say Revelation or Matthew, like that's the eschatological, the end times, this is the picture and so um, uh, a principle I think we can hold on to, when we believe the Lord is coming, we can wait better. When he, we believe the Lord is coming, we can wait better because there's true hope. We can be about his business because he is coming to rescue us. He's not going to leave us here just languishing in, the, in some, like sucked in some corner of some dingy old high school gym. Um, we can, he's coming to rescue us. 
We can wait for him to vindicate us. We don't have to defend ourselves. We don't have to despair that sin and death will have the last word in our lives. Because he is coming to heal and give abundance, we can learn to trust him in times of pain and scarcity. That that will be, that these are the short times and the long part of life, the long story is the one of abundant joy because he is coming to restore everything that is broken. We don't have to wring our hands as if he's not in control. We don't have to like flounder around and look to put our hope in politics or science or any other human systems. Um, Because he is coming to rule in righteousness, we shouldn't wait to work and be a part of that. He has an idea of what his kingdom should look like. And friends, he is calling us now to help to participate with him, to love what he loves, to be about our father's business, to care for the weak and the poor and the marginalized, to love our neighbor's love with Christ's love, to love the unlovable, and to tear down and to prioritize them over our own comfort, our own privilege, our own powers, and rather to be about his business. Okay, sorry. Let's, let's pray and we can wrap up. Lord, thank you for your goodness, for your kindness. Uh, be with us as we continue to study your word. Thank you for the food that you're providing. And um, Lord, we pray that you would, in your mercy, um, continue your good work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends.